This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community does matter, especially on Stan the Energy Man, where today it's all about community. In fact, it's about your house. And can you really go off the grid and things like that? Some good questions. So I have my very favorite electrical engineer from Burns and McDonald's, Mr. Ryan Woman, is here today. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about whether it makes sense for you to to even think about coming off the grid or, you know, things like that. Because there's a lot that goes into that decision. And some folks have made the decision and haven't planned well and it hasn't turned out well. But there's some tools out there for you and there's some things that you need to know and it might be the right thing to do. So we're going to go through that and uh, try to explore it as deeply as we can. So Ryan, thanks for being with us today. You bet. Thanks and, for having uh, me. And being our expert, a residential Hawaii expert here. And um, so tell us what you've learned. You've gone out and done some homework on this and you... You work it day to day on a large scale with big companies and big big plant, but uh, what did you find out about um, things on the residential scale? Sure. Um, so you approached me earlier this week about talking today, and you said, "What about microgridding or coming off the grid on your on your house?" A great topic. Um, I do that for larger clients, as you know. We've worked together with providing coming off the grid more of an like an energy security standpoint. A little mm -hmm. bit different thought. Where uh, at your house, you're not planning for zombie apocalypse and coming off the grid, you're, you're doing it for your own reasons on being uh, renewable yourself mm -hmm. or, or saving more money yourself. So I went online and went to the, the HECO website for me to, to see what their rules and regulations were and what information was available. That's a, a great mm -hmm. place to start. And it turned out to actually be very helpful. I don't remember exactly which menu I went through, but I, I very quickly found um, a link to say, well, how much solar can I install in my house? What's it going to do for me? And, and what kind of storage would I need to just level out, essentially be zero? It'll, it'll ask you your address, and it just shows you on the map where your house is. Uh, you can decide if that was correct or not, but let's assume that it was. And it'll get you the next phase, and it'll ask you, well, how much sun did, is hitting your roof? Mm -hmm. uh, that's one, one variable we should talk about. What direction does your roof face? Yeah. Um, another, another great variable to talk about. And then how much energy are you using right now? I mm -hmm. think those were the only three that it, that it asked me. And it, it's a really simple interface, and mm -hmm. it, it proved to be very close. And in my case, my house is using about 15 kilowatt hours a day. Okay. It varies between 12 and 15 for, for that's me. That's pretty good. Over the, over the last you know, year. Yeah, my house is 21. 21? Mm -hmm. You got a pool or something there? I uh, my wife leaves all out. the lights on. <laughs> so let's take 15. Okay. That was what I ended up doing in my, in my back check of, of the, the HECO model. Um, you can also just find that on your bill if mm -hmm. anyone's curious yeah. on where to find it. I did it myself. I have a big spreadsheet and got way in depth. And then I checked my bill because I wanted to add in some dollars. And they show me right there yeah. what my kilowatt hours per day is. Mm -hmm. The 15 kilowatt hours a day, then it came back and said, you know, my, my roof faces almost south. Let, let me rewind. That's talking about the roof. Which, which way your roof faces? South would be ideal. Ideal. Because yeah. you're going to be facing the sun most mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. um, southeast, southwest, you're going to get some gains. If, you're, if your pain faces the north, you're going to be building some extra structure to get it facing south. Mm -hmm. It adds that calculation in for you. And then how much sun you're getting on your roof, I think people can generally understand. If you're getting shade. Yeah. Are you in a valley? A or you got a lot of big trees on either side of your house? Big, maybe your neighbor has a two-story building, or you have a high-rise right up next to you on one side. Yep. Like so you that. can go in there and say, I'm getting low, medium, high shade amounts. And it'll add that into the model. Um, I was hoping for a little bit more that I, I could talk about how much shade I get, because I'm right up against the coal house, so I, I kind of wanted to say that I'm, my, my day gets cut short mm -hmm. pretty quick. Um, but it was still good, and came back and said, hey, you need uh, 4.1 kW DC uh, worth of solar, solar panels being installed. And then he gave me a square footage of how much that space that would take on my mm -hmm. roof, uh, which wasn't that bad. I, I do a little back check on that, and that says, Okay, four, let's do a really simple math. Just multiply that by four hours a day. It doesn't work exactly like that. But that came out and it says, okay, so this software's telling me I need about 16 kilowatt hours a day 
to go on top of my 15 kilowatt hours of load. Mm -hmm. So my back check against that number said, okay, yeah, you guys, are, you guys are about right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it came back and said I needed, I think, eight kilowatt hours of storage. So well, that's probably about right too, because you're gonna get okay. you're gonna get a little bit low right at the evening and in the morning, but most of the time you're gonna be real low. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that's about right too. So the tool was available online through Hico. I I'm always a little skeptical when I when I see those things. Cause everyone seems to have an agenda, and the tool was easy to use, and it was it was actually pretty accurate as far as what I backed. I would have oversized it, mm -hmm. being an engineer. I wanted a little more fluff on on some certain things, whereas Someone else might go out and, and skimp on it a little bit, and then mm -hmm. you're going to be a little more unsatisfied. Well, you haven't bought your Tesla yet. So. <laughs> I haven't bought my Tesla. It'll be a while unless those prices come down to like 10%. Okay. <laughs> um, so that was the tool, and it, it gave you, a, it painted the picture for you of what it would be to, let's say, be net zero, mm -hmm. which would be I produce and consume all my own energy at my house with solar and storage. And it, then it gave you the links of the applications to fill out to, mm -hmm. to go after that and a list of equipment that you could use to go after that. Their pricing seemed a little high to me. For the um, equipment. For the equipment. And I went back to manufacturers and, and tried to make a couple calls yesterday. It was a little late for mm -hmm. some of the mainland um, manufacturers. Mm -hmm. But uh, from my research, they were, they were close. And with the government subsidies always changing, it's a little hard to mm -hmm. always stay right yeah. up to date with that. So, and I'd rather overestimate than, than lowball it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to be told it's going to cost me five and someone comes back and charges me seven for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I would, I would recommend if you want or are interested in just a broad picture without calling someone so a sales guy is calling you all the time mm -hmm. or getting a bunch of junk mail, go there and check it out. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to paint the picture of what the requirements would be mm -hmm. and get you thinking, all right, is, is this right for me? And then yeah. you bounce that against your, your reason. So that's really good news because, uh, you know, most folks wouldn't know where to start. They might call a solar company and then, then you, like you say, everybody has a, a, an angle on this thing. Um, but it sounds like Hawaiian Electric's website is a good place to go, pretty accurate. You know, you, you backfed the math in there and it pretty much checked out. And when it, when it did work out, it was a little on the high side. So you're not afraid you're going to, you know, get caught with some unexpected costs. Um, let's talk a little bit though about um, maybe in some special applications like yours is a standard house but maybe somebody runs their business out of their house and they run power tools and compressors and things like that. Um, would they have to worry about uh, peak loads and things like that like, uh, like equipment that has a really fast draw and maybe um, pulls more amps than, than the average house does and you may have to do something special to your house for that kind of situation? Yeah. you. When you, when you make the leap to more of a commercial application or a larger facility, the amount of um, variables gets a lot higher. On the, the house side, make sure you're always looking at that inverter, the energy storage device is going to tell you what your continuous load can be, mm -hmm. and then your peak. The peak's going to be a little bit higher, and it'll be able to do that peak for a little bit of time. The equipment's going to get hot, and it's going to start to say, I can't help you out anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, look for those numbers to be four to five continuous, that's mm -hmm. about what you'll use at your house, and then maybe seven or eight on the peak in case you have a, maybe a closed dryer that you want to start while everything else is going. Mm -hmm. That would be about your worst case scenario. In a commercial setting, it's about the same. We, we, we want to start a drill press or just a crane or a big overhead door. Those, those draw a high amount of energy for a short amount of time. If you want it to be off the grid, and able to support that, your equipment, your peak level on that equipment needs to be sized mm -hmm. so you can give those short bursts. You have a bigger facility now. Generally speaking, if you're over two stories, you probably won't have the square footage on your roof to cover that with solar. Okay. We're going to have to start looking at supplementing with some other renewables or having some, you know, the, your parking lot needs to start getting, mm. getting included in this conversation. But that's that's a little bit of a break even, um, and that, that came from, I was talking to your second favorite electrical engineer this morning about Mr. that. Mr. Botha? Yeah, Mr. Botha. Oh, okay. That number came from him, and, and I think he's, he's, he's probably spot on there with, with his experience that it's rough. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have a big warehouse and a lot of square footage, LED lights, it's going to be different. Yeah. But you'll have to be sizing your equipment 
it's generally going to be larger to, to, mm -hmm. to make up for those short bursts of energy. So, so basically what the HECO website does for you is it takes into account some of the major factors and it kind of puts a, a formula, a conservative formula against them. But if you really, really wanted to do that all by yourself, you would have to literally go through your house and look at the draw on all your motors, the peak draw and stuff, and add it all up and, and come up with what, if like your refrigerator and your freezer and your compressor and your drill press and your air conditioner and your dryer all went on at once, boom, you could get this peak load. I have to size my stuff for that. So the, the HECO website is great for the average residential unit, but you're saying if you have a two-story house um, or you know you have a lot of extra equipment uh, over and above the average house, uh, you, you might want to have an electrical engineer or somebody really help you calculate a little bit better. Yeah, start reaching out to the, we'll say the professionals or the, the skilled label, skilled labor, excuse me, to to help you evaluate that. You'll you'll want to take more measurements. If you if you do the same thing with the Eco website does on your commercial spot, you'll end up you'll likely end up oversizing it. Even be a little skeptical of an engineer that's going in and taking a bunch of measurements. Um, or if they're just looking at drawings, you'll probably end up oversizing it. Well, you know, based on history, that's probably not a bad thing because my house was built back in the 60s. No computers, uh, no big screen TVs, no disposals, no electric dishwashers, no microwave ovens. <laughs> and when you add all that into the load on your house, the service in my house is barely enough to handle my house. So if I was going to design a PV system, uh, but I'm sure the HECO thing is more up to date. But, uh, but the bottom line is, over time, we're going to be using more and more electricity. Like I say, you might buy that Tesla one of these days once you bump John Botoff off his job and get a pay raise. <laughs> um, you might be able to get some more money to afford a Tesla. Well, let's only and, hope so, right? And then you'd want to charge it at home so you're not using dirty coal or, or oil to charge your yeah. Tesla. So you, you might have to oversize. Or you, you might even want to plan on that. You know, mm -hmm. um, if you know you're going to go to a battery vehicle or say you want to go to a battery vehicle, and your office doesn't give you charging at the office to, you know, when, when there's plenty of solar out there, uh, you'd want to upsize your batteries and your solar so that at night when you bring your car home, you can charge your car at night. Yep, absolutely. I think that scenario is, is a perfect segue into the other part that I want to talk about, which is I'm not going to take John's job. He's, he's way too smart for me. <laughs> but if... So that doesn't give me my Tesla, but if, if I did go through buying that 4.1 uh, KW solar and 8 megawatt hours of storage, I'm going to feel great. And as an electrical engineer, I'm going to nerd out about it for a while. But what am I going to do during the day? I'll probably flip on my little AC unit so my dog's cooler during the day. Like I internally will, will change my energy habits because I'm going to mm -hmm. feel like I'm getting free green energy. Mm -hmm. So when you're going through that process, uh, an electric vehicle would be a big part of that future that you want to size for. It's just adding another solar panel is not is not as easy as right. it is. Leaving your square footage on the roof, it's it's more than that. It's that inverter, that that continuous and peak, right. and then the storage. How much we're, we're capturing during mm -hmm. during the day that that'll affect a, an electric vehicle. That's a that's a biggie. Mm -hmm. um, smaller, I'd say it's definitely the niceties, the things that we have subconsciously figured out, wow, power is a little expensive, let's turn the lights off, let's do this, let's not run the AC. You might start doing it once you feel like it's free. Yeah. And now we weren't 15 kilowatt, maybe you were 15 kilowatt hours, but mm -hmm. now you're 17, 18, 21. Mm -hmm. So it just raises your awareness. Like mm -hmm. right now most of us run through the house and just flip lights on and off or leave them on or whatever, or leave the TV going or you know, whatever, and we pay the bill and that's easy. But when you forked out a couple thousand bucks for inverters and batteries and things like that, now you have to think about it. I leave that power on, it's costing me. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm wasting my, my time here. Or maybe I won't get a full charge on my Tesla, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, I really need to. So um, it's good to oversize to a degree, but then the more you oversize, the more it costs you up front. So there's a balance there, just like everything else. You're going to pay for it, but, you know, you're going to pay for it up front. So if you can afford it, and you can afford to oversize knowing that you're going to have an electric charger on your car, great. You can do things like that. Well, what we're going to do right now is take a quick break, and we'll be back with Ryan Wilkins to talk a little bit more about should you go on or off the grid. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present ThinkTech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together 
researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me one o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manila. Oh, hi guys. It's RB Kelly. I'm your host of Out of the Comfort Zone, where I find cool people with cool solutions to problems that all of us face. Now, the thing is, we're really cool, and I only invite really cool people, but the thing is, I think you're kind of cool too, so I think you should come and watch. That Thursdays at 11 a.m. here on OC16 Television with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm R.B. Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and I will see you next Thursday. I will see you right now. Thanks for coming back to Standard Energy Man on my lunch hour. This is so much fun. I love spending my lunch hour with Ryan. We kind of geek out on talking about energy stuff, especially if I can get him talking to hydrogen. We go crazy. But um, anyway, Ryan, thanks for uh, helping us out today and talking about uh, what it takes to move off the grid. And there's, there's actually some other things to think about, too. Um, we talked about, in general, how you would design a thing for your house, but then there's the question of, do you stay connected to HECO, or do you come all the way off the grid? I mean, are you confident enough to really just basically pull yourself off? And not only can you do it, but is it the right thing to do? Um, I can tell you right now, just as a, a, in rough numbers, if half the people um, defected from the grid, the other half would be paying for the grid, and their electric bills would go exponential because it's expensive to run a grid. And the way HECO's rate structures are set up, you know, big users pay big fees up front, but residential users, it's all kind of into their kilowatt per kilowatt hour rate. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're counting on everybody sharing, kind of like insurance. Um, so what are some of, how are some of those factors uh, playing into this? Yeah, absolutely. So right now we all share the burden of the cost of, of the grid infrastructure. Similar to, I think, to correlate for people, our roads right now are paid off of a tax on gasoline. Mm -hmm. When all the cars got more fuel efficient, there was less money going into to fund our roads. Then we got a little more clever with how we build cars against weight in, in a way instead of just off the fuel tax. For the grid, it's the same thing. We're all using it and kind of paying our, our rate, which built into there was supporting the infrastructure. Um, when power lines get hit on Kamehameha Windward, which seems to happen far too What's often, <laughs> um, that has to be replaced and fixed, and there's labor, there's cost. We all It's all built into our rate uh, to fix that. If everybody went in and just pulled their plug and they're not paying anything back out, It'll go on to the other people. That's that's fine. It, it's up to you, your own decision. Now, now you're a house sitting on your own with a roof that can put PV on it. What if you live in an apartment? Yeah, and at that point, you're you're probably not going to be able to to make it happen. Yeah. If you did have the solar and the battery, or the the hydrogen, or the the storage to be able to come off the grid completely, you need to start to think about your own energy security. In case you do, you really want to pull that plug. If a, if a coconut or something hits your, your solar panel and cracks it, you're going to have reduced output for how long does it take to replace that panel. A hurricane comes by or high winds, mm -hmm. something simple, simple like that could, even just cracking or putting a, a little bit of a dirty film on your, your solar panels it. will degrade yeah. it, uh, I would say significantly, to, mm -hmm. to reduce your output. So as, a, as the individual residents, your energy security is that, that that line of you being connected to ECO. Even if you're not using it, which let's make sure people understand, there is a charge to be connected. connected. Mm -hmm. And that charge is because, yeah, you're not using any power, but you're sharing the, the at least the maintenance cost. Mm -hmm. So it, that charge is, I want to say valid. That's uh, your insurance it, policy. It, and it's your insurance policy to make mm -hmm. sure that you're, you're connected to that. Um, you, you really need to judge if you really want to get all the way off and just say, not for me, on how you're going to handle mm -hmm. an emergency situation or just a typical maintenance situation. You know, a refrigerator breaks, you just go down to, to the hardware store and you pick up a new one. It's right there. Solar, it's not a one-for-one. One. You can't just kind of scab things on. They, they do need to fit within a system, and then the resources have to be there to make that installed. It's, mm -hmm. it's much more difficult in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So... 
um, the, the, the times that I can think you'd want to completely disconnect and that were, would actually be beneficial not only to the individual but to the utility is when you're in a really rural spot. Like uh, there's a lot of people off the grid in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Why? Because to drag a power line 20 miles from the main line to your house and put all the boosting equipment and stuff, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes. And you just, it's just not practical. It's better to, to put $10,000 into your own system and not have to worry about the utility. So there probably are some places in rural Oahu or on the neighbor islands where coming off the grid makes complete sense. Even even mm -hmm. Hika wouldn't argue with you because right. otherwise they have to take care of all these lines and that means you know more cost to them. So there are times, but in most cases, you look at it right now like that that charge was at twenty five bucks. Twenty five right now is a is a pretty decent insurance policy. Yeah, not to pay. I'd definitely say so. And if you're remote and you're you're operating on your own microgrid, um, you're going to handle your energy usage a little bit differently because mm -hmm. you have a scarcity of a resource. So you're a little more energy conscious at, at that point in time. And hopefully we all get there even with our free energy or mm -hmm. our low cost energy or some people will say medium or high. If we all start to practice like that scarcity, uh, the overall cost would, would come down for mm -hmm. all of us. There's some things to be learned from, from people successfully off the grid right now. Okay. Can I sucker you into some hydrogen discussion yeah, about this? Okay. I'd love to talk about okay. that. I knew I'd squeeze that in. Um, we talk about energy storage in general, and we generally talk about batteries as energy storage. That's, that's the most common form of, bat of energy storage that we all think of. Yep. Um, and then there's different kinds of batteries. You have lead acid batteries, you got deep cycle batteries, you got Double A's um, and triple A's. Yeah, you got metal metal storage batteries like double A's and triple A's. You got um, you got uh, flow batteries. You've got um, lithium iron batteries. You got lithium phosphate. You got lithium different kinds of lithium batteries even. Mm -hmm. So they all come with different price tags. But there's also the hydrogen storage, which is of course my favorite thing to talk about. So. What do you think some of the possibilities would be if you say oversize your roof a little bit and whenever you had surplus energy and your batteries were already charged up, now some of that leftover electricity goes to a small electrolyzer and you start storing hydrogen in a tank in your backyard at low pressure um, and use that for energy storage. And then you get your fuel cell car. Is that is that a viable thing? Yeah, it's actually, it's not just viable but there's a lot of goodness that comes from that type of model. So batteries, great for short-term, generally small storage of energy. Where in my house, I'm overproducing solar and I just want to use some of that at night. And, it, and a battery has a way of just kind of shifting that over. We call that solar shifting if it's hydrogen or, or use on a battery. The really great thing about hydrogen is that's providing us that really deep amount of hours of usage, but also using it for different things. Uh, a hydrogen fuel cell car, very popular, especially in um, more of Japan, I think. Yeah, have the, Japan, the, South Korea, and China are all yep. stepping out on hydrogen fuel cell. Appliances can be hydrogen fuel. Yeah, you can cook with it. If we s start looking at different uh, use of appliances, I mean, I have, a, I have a propane tank, so let me clarify, that's probably one reason my, my electric mm. bill gets a little bit lower, but that could um, be fueled off of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, your sun and that's your can, water heater can and your right oven, night. right? Yeah. Okay. What else do you run off your propane? The, wa the water heater and uh, cooking utensils and what else? Is that's that all it? I have. No. Okay. Yep. Um, not my dryer. Some people's dryers are. Oh yeah, that's true. Propane, They're a clothes dryer. But I'm yeah. a, I'm electric on that. Okay. Um, the hydrogen storage makes makes a lot of sense if you really want that. The multi-use, uh, transporting as, as a fuel. Um, if you had that hydrogen system built into your house and now you're, you're remote or you decided to pull the plug on the utility, your energy sec security can be, it's a, almost the equivalent of a propane tank. You're, you can go to the store and pick up your, your energy security and, and plug it in. You're, you're in a much different scenario mm -hmm. uh, if you have that ability. Okay, great. Because that's... That's one of those things that even a long time ago I fantasized over is no electric bill, no gas bill for your car, and you're just, you know, you're your own energy provider with some solar or some wind. 
have you really looked at many wind options? Um, I know wind power either comes in the super big turbines or the kind on a sailboat, you know, little dinky ones that generate some electricity for your DC system. Um, have you seen any out there that are kind of in the medium size range or that would be practical for Hawaii in a residential application? I did a study when I was back in school that, that simulated just this. It was a, a solar, wind, and at that time I think it was even a lead acid battery microgrid, and mm -hmm. I, I built a program to analyze, I think it was at one in every, one position in every state, what the system would have to be sized as. When I went into that study, I found the, the mid-range and small-scale wind uh, turbines at that time, we're talking 10 years ago, mm -hmm. well, much different than where we're at today. There are options out there. They're not, to me, they, they, they weren't and maybe still aren't as attractive on a, on a cost per kW scale. Now, the, the nice part is you're diversifying uh, your energy. Mm -hmm. so, so there is a value to that, that that's harder to spell out in just I'm paying $100 for a widget. But uh, they are available. They don't look great, and some of them look a little crazy, but um, Some of them are a little possible. noisy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they have more maintenance because they got more moving parts. Yep, absolutely. Um, so you have those factors. Um, I know that with the big wind turbines, you have problems with like birds and bats flying into them and killing them. I don't think that's as big a problem with the smaller turbines. Um, in fact, you can even put markings on the blades so that the birds don't want to go in there and stuff. Um, how about on the electrical side? Is there is it harder to hook in? Um, wind than solar, or can they both hooked in, be hooked in the same system? And do you have to design that in up front, or can you add wind later? Or? It'll all depend on that inverter and the capabilities. That that inverter for our residential size, there that's kind of your power manager in a way. So you're likely able to add a, a small scale wind after you've done the solar. Mm -hmm. It'll be it'll be really due to that inverter. Wind acts similar to solar in that it can be variant. Uh, your solar hits a cloud, that power output's going to drop right. just as much as a wind gust can hit that, that mm -hmm. turbine and spin it up for a little bit and then it slows back down. So they, they have similar properties, they just, they're operating at different times. The great thing about wind, it's going to be operating at night. Yeah. So I, I should look at it here if we were to put in just something small on the top of the house. Can we, the idea and the hope would be to downsize my energy storage device mm -hmm. because the wind's going to be helping me out at yeah. night. You got to plan for a night with no wind, but yep. if you got that, that, that hookup, that energy security or the, the minimum payment to, mm -hmm. to your utility, then, then you'll be okay and you don't really need that storage as, as much. Okay. Well, believe it or not, we've buzzed through a that's whole it. half hour here, my friend, and um, that's going to be it for Stan Energy Man, but uh, I tell you what. If you haven't been able to figure out whether you can pull yourself off the grid after watching this show, it's because you weren't paying attention. No. Um, go to the HECO website and do a little bit of homework on there and, and think about some of the things we talked about today and see if any of the special conditions apply to you. And um, it might be the right thing to do. So until next week on Stan Energy Man, aloha, and we'll see you next week. Thanks to Cindy and Robert in the control room for making all the magic happen. Aloha.